gold boots that the Romans put there, and they would exact uh, 15 pence from you for walking on their road, making sure they got their taxes, you see, right? Pay the tolls. I, I just, I wondered how many people skirted those toll booths back in those days, headed into the bush when they saw one coming up. Well, that's like a lot of us today, isn't it, I think? A lot of people today. Uh, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear. That means reverence, uh, a social debt, all right? Uh, when you're at a, at a meeting, I, I can only think of just this one example. I'm sorry, I can't elaborate. But, you know, when they sing the national anthem at a gathering, uh, when it's required, we'll do it, you know. <laughs> you know, it's a simple thing, but it shows a, a willingness, a spirit that you are a faithful citizen. Now, we know that... Uh, there are a lot of problems involved here, and several people have mentioned this, and I don't want to leave it without dealing with that this morning. Honor to whom honor. Before we leave this and elaborate on it this morning, I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 17 to see this one example. Matthew chapter 17. Verses 24 to 27. They both lived in the land of Palestine under the Romans. And somebody came up to Peter and uh, said, Hey, doesn't uh, your friend Jesus pay, your ta pay his taxes? Doesn't he pay any taxes? What about this, this fellow? Let's read that. And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Does not your master pay tribute? He said, Yes. And when he was coming to the house, Jesus spoke first to him, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon? Jesus knew what had happened, and he was already thinking about it. Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their own sons or of strangers? Peter saith unto him, Of strangers. Jesus said unto him, Then are the sons free. Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, Go thou to the sea, and cast the hook, and take up the fish that first cometh up. And when thou hast opened its mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money, that take, and, and give unto them for me and thee. Now, uh, there's a miracle here involved here, and some people are automatically going to throw this out of the Bible because they don't believe in miracles. Well, aside from the miracle, there's a very definite principle here. And I'm not uh, saying that the miracle didn't happen. I, I believe it did. Uh... Jesus paid his taxes, right? Here's an example. Jesus paid his taxes. He paid his tribute money. Uh, and notice the principle that, that we find in this respect. In verse 27, Jesus himself believed since he was a son of the Father and since government was really under his Father that it wasn't necessary. He wasn't obligated in principle to pay the taxes to the Romans that they demanded of him. But, he said, lest we should offend them, pay them. Now, I don't want to build a doctrine on that. Uh, that's the only verse I know that says that. Uh, that where, in reality, we as Christians, Christians, <laughs> of all people, don't, shouldn't have to pay their taxes. But lest we should offend them, let's pay them. All right? Lest we should offend them. Uh, the implication is here that anybody that's not a son of God should pay taxes. But those who are not sons of God don't have to, but they ought to for the sake of the governments under which they live. Now, uh, that's just merely a passing point. But the point that we see here is that Jesus paid his taxes. This is a good example. You know, they threw this up to Jesus on the very day they crucified him. This is one of the trumped up charges that Jesus never did answer, never did uh, try to vindicate himself on. Some, somebody stood up and said, Caesar, this man doesn't pay his taxes to the Roman government. Now, Caesar knew better, and uh, he, it wasn't even elaborated on, but this is one of the false charges that Jesus was charged with. Now, Let's 
leave Romans chapter 13 for a moment and just spread out <coughs> in our discussion of this subject and elaborate on some of the problems here. We've been discussing good government. Paul has been. All right? What are the, I guess, what you call the ideal or the normal, the natural circumstances that we Christians find ourselves in? All right? We ought to be obedient to our government, obviously, and we ought to pay our taxes and render under Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. All right? Be good citizens. In as far as possible that you have the ability and strength to do, be good citizens. And don't try to get out of it. And we have those examples. Now let's discuss what ought a Christian's responsibility to his government be when there are oppressive laws, when laws are unfair, when laws are not necessarily for the good of the citizen. I think we have some good biblical precedents here. First of all, let me summarize what I believe a Christian's responsibility is in this case. Number one, I think that we ought to stand up for our rights within the legal limits. Our government provides for us to contest certain laws. Now, if you're opposed to this or that, well, stand up for your rights within the legal limits. Jesus did. Paul did. Um, Jesus uh, exercised his freedom of speech uh, to the Jewish Sanhedrin on numerous, numerous occasions. Um, um, in Matthew chapter 5, you have many examples there where Jesus said, you have heard that the law, the Jewish law, which was more than just a religious thing, was a social thing. You've heard that the law says do this and do this and do this and do this, but I say do this and do this and do this and do this. He exercised his um, freedom of speech. Now, Jesus was a unique character. He was God, and so he could change those laws. And so we will not dwell on that for that reason. But Paul exercised his freedoms as a Roman city citizen on at least two occasions. Uh, they went to beat him one time, and Paul wasn't going to stand for that. That was unfair. That wasn't right. And he stood up and said, you're going to beat me? I'm a Roman. I got the rights of a Roman. And according to the Romans, if one Roman beat another Roman, without first giving him a court appearance, appearance, the Roman that beat the other Roman could be killed. Now, that was a serious offense. All right? Now, Paul stood up for his rights. He had the legal right to do that, and he went as far as the law allow allowed him not to be beaten. Now, he was beaten on many occasions for the Lord, for the testimony of the Lord. But there is examples of this. One time, Paul staged a sit-in. Uh, he was in the jail of Philippi, and... Uh, he had been thrown there with Silas overnight, and uh, they beat them the next morning and said, get out of here, go, leave us in peace. And they hadn't even bothered to find out whether they were Roman citizens or not. And Paul said, I'm not moving until you come and fetch me out of here yourselves, because I'm a Roman citizen. And they ran to the commander, and that's recorded in Acts chapter 16. Uh, and told him, you beat a Roman citizen. The guy come and fell on his knees and begged him to leave, please leave. <laughs> right? Now, Paul did it within the, the limits of the law. You have some precedents there. All right? If you must go against what the laws say, well, then do it within legal, li legal limits. And keep a non-militant or a non-violent or a non-reactionary approach. At the most, we have, Paul sat down. He didn't pick up a sword and start, you know, killing those jailers. Uh, he did, Jesus wasn't a revolutionary in the political sense. If anybody had, you know, if, if we're going to have any grounds for being this way as Christians, certainly Jesus would have been. He lived in a very unjust society. The Romans were terrible people. Their, their society was very unjust. It was tyrannous, all right? Jesus wasn't a political activist. He was a pacifist, all right? Now, those two things go together. <coughs> if it, uh, Paul is a good example here in this very respect uh, with having to do with slavery. Slavery. Do we believe in slavery today? No, of course not. I don't. Maybe Pat does. <laughs> but uh, Paul never did put down Christians who own slaves for having slaves. He, he, in fact, he wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 
uh, 20 and 21 for slaves to abide in that calling. Be happy being a slave. Just serve the Lord in the position where you've been called. He never did uh, tell Philemon to, get, uh, to, to emancipate Onesimus. Rather, he said, restore him to his original position as a slave. Don't cut his head off. All right? All right? So, uh, peacekeeping, nonviolence is the Christian attitude. And one more thing that goes along with this. Uh, in unfair situations concerning the law. Right, it's going to come down, perhaps, we'll just have to trust the Lord to uh, recompense and to reward in His time. And the Bible says that we ought to pray for those in authority over us. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 says, Pray for kings and those who are in authority. If you don't like the laws under which you live, if you think they're fair and discriminatory, go as far as you can in the legal limits to change those things as a Christian. And be a peaceful person about it. Don't go overboard and become militant. And pray. I read uh, a story uh, this re related by Richard Wormbrand, who's a, a Romanian pastor that spent, I think, 13 or 14 years of his life in jail for being a Christian, of a woman that he knew in Russia that prayed for God to remove a certain official in the government because he was a terrible person. He was just killing all kinds of Christians, literally. And he was putting them in jail and all kinds of... sending them to Siberia. And she prayed that God remove that man from office. And God did. The man was removed, banished from that position by someone else. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> now that's uh, a Christian in our relationship to government, which is unfair, oppressive, we, we can't get along with. All right, that we just don't agree with. Now, there's no evidence there that we ought to go against it. I should give you two other references there. Um, in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 8, a very interesting verse, and Psalm 94, verses 1 through 10, are two good references that tell us our recourses as Christians when we live in an unjust society. <coughs> By the way, I think we should thank the Lord because we have a very free society. And we ought to thank the Lord for the freedoms we have. You know, there's a lot of people in the world that can't take legal means to change the government. All right? But we can. Now, let's move on to one and most, uh, most important point. And that is, what about government that is anti-God? The government that is so oppressive that even goes as far as saying, you can't worship Jesus Christ. You can't gather in groups to worship, to fellowship, to teach, and to preach, to learn. You can't teach your children about Jesus Christ. You can't pray. It's unlawful to do so. Now, there are governments like this. All right? Well, basically speaking, when it comes to this point, and this point alone, Christians are required to disobey the law. And only on this point. Not just when we don't agree with a certain principle of law, or this law, or that law. But when those laws have to do with our relationship directly to God, our worship, our prayer, our teaching, our preaching, our evangelism, our gathering together as Christians, we are not just recommended, we're told. And we're given examples where we ought to disobey God, um, disobey men in this respect. Let me give you the examples that we have in Scripture. That, uh, of which I'm aware. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three Hebrew slaves that were contemporaries of Daniel that lived in, in Babylon, were commanded with everyone else in the empire to bow down to a golden image of the king. Did they? No. They were cast into a, 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 a furnace, a furnace because of that disobedience. And God miraculously delivered them but they disobeyed. Daniel chapter 3. They worshiped God and not the king. Daniel himself in Daniel chapter 6 is recorded. Um, without his knowledge or a, maybe he did know, a law was passed in Medo-Persia where some people were trying to get rid of him. They knew he prayed to Jehovah three times a day and they got a law passed that said you can't pray to anybody but the king, Darius, the king of the Medo-Persians. And Daniel didn't stop praying when that law went into effect. He opened his window. It was even visible. 
He didn't just hide in his house and turn to the east. He opened his window to the east and prayed publicly. Disobeyed that law publicly. And he was thrown in the den of lions. We all know the outcome. Peter and the apostles. Uh, actually, Peter and John specifically. In John Acts chapter 4, verses 17 to 20. We're preaching about Jesus Christ and the resurrection from the dead and the life that came only through Jesus Christ and not the Jews and the law of Moses. And the Sanhedrin, which was more than just a political body in those days, it was a, more than a religious body, it was political as well. The Sanhedrin called them into the court and said, don't preach about Jesus Christ. And their words, we cannot but speak the things which we have heard and seen. We cannot but speak the things which we have heard and seen. They disobeyed. And they went right out and they started preaching again. Immediately after they got out of court, they went out in the street and started preaching. They disobeyed the law. And they were beaten for it then. Peter and the apostles as a group, not just Peter and John, but in the next chapter, Acts chapter 5, verses 17 to 32, you have a case where these men uh, were preached in the temple and the Sanhedrin had enough this time. And they didn't, they didn't threaten them first. They brought them in and they beat them first. And then they threatened them and they beat them some more and they let them go. They said, don't preach. And they preached anyways. And they rejoiced. <clears throat> so let me give you three points, I believe, of the Christian responsibility when a government actually becomes anti-God and forbids these things. Number one, we have to do what is biblically right. And that's limited to our worship and evangelism and our teaching and so forth as Christians, not just to any old law that we think about. Secondly, we ought to be ready to give an answer when we're called up at that particular point in time. And inversely all, but one of the examples that we've, I've just given you, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were required by the king to tell why. And they did. They said, we will not serve or worship the golden image. You see, we will not. We will not. There's no question, King. There's no, I'm not going to do that. Right? Be ready to give a testimony. Peter says that. We ought to be ready to give an answer at any time to, to anyone who asks a reason of the hope. All right? Be ready to give an answer when you disobey. <coughs> uh, Daniel, it doesn't say that he gave an answer right away. It says they grabbed Daniel and it didn't even take him to the king. They just took him right to the den of lions. But afterwards, he gave an answer to the king. And he said... My God hath sent his angel. My God has delivered me, King. He gave a testimony. Peter and John, uh, we cannot but speak the things that we have heard and seen. We ought to obey God rather than men, is the most famous phrase in the Bible on that subject. We ought to obey God rather than men. I, I, th I want to stress that it's very important that we see the delineation line on what we should and should not disobey the government on. And that only has to do with our worship, our evangelism, our direct serving the Lord. And for no other reason. The only example uh, to the contrary is where Paul sat down and disobeyed the order that the authorities gave him to get up and go. And that was a passive resistance. It was not a violent, militant resistance. It was a passive resistance in itself. And it was to enforce to those people, or it was, it was to make those leaders carry out their God-ordained functions, you see. It was for them to carry out the laws that they were supposed to carry out, you see. It wasn't uh, to, to radically change the law or anything like that. And then the third point in closing, we ought to be ready to suffer faithfully and rejoicing as a partaker of Christ's sufferings. This is the complete tenor and spirit of suffering for Christians we have all the way through the New Testament. Paul says, "He that lived God, those that live godly in Christ shall suffer persecution. It's just, that's the two go hand in hand. If you're going to live godly for Christ, you will suffer. I think the day's coming we're going to suffer. I, I just can't see how it's going to keep going. And, and we're just going to get by and reap all the cream and never have any of the dregs uh, in our society, right? Um, Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, 3, and 4. I want you to read those chapters if you have questions on this subject. That describes how we're to suffer. Not for doing wrong, 
but we're to do right, be good citizens, live for the Lord, be honest before all men, serve the Lord, and if it comes that you must suffer for being a Christian, for doing what is right, then suffer rejoicing. That was Paul's testimony. He rejoiced when he suffered. And uh, you read church history, and you're going to find that God just does something to a Christian's mind and heart. He gives us the ability to rejoice in trial when, when it comes to that point. You don't have to be afraid of that. Live day by day. God gives grace. Paul rejoiced in his suffering. He ended up in jail with his head cut off. All right? Peter ended up on a cross crucified upside down. Uh, John ended up on a, on a, a lonely island, uh, banished uh, to exile. And most of the, the prophets and the apostles were martyred for their faith. And um, Fox's Book of Martyrs is a history of the early church uh, and the sufferings that they went through. Christians, we will suffer. We will suffer. There's no question about it. But let's suffer for the right things. Let's be good citizens. Remember, we're not citizens of this earth only. We are citizens primarily of heaven. We're citizens of heaven. But we ought to live as good citizens on the earth. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you acknowledging our high calling as your children, knowing that we